Hello, everybody. Welcome to Intermediate Accounting 17th Edition uh, Video Solution Walkthrough, uh, Kiso, Weingan, and Warfield Exercise 5-5. Uh, this question, I'm allowed to create a video solution from it. Uh, and I want to thank Wiley for allowing me to do this. I want to give him a huge shout out. Uh, I consider this book to be the absolute gold standard. I learned on the 6th edition uh, back in the day at UC Santa Barbara. I actually recently rebought that book, but uh, this is absolutely the gold standard for intermediate accounting, at least it's my gold standard. So uh, the questions used in this presentation is copyright 2019 by John Wiley and Sons, all rights are reserved for educational purposes only. You may not distribute the video or redistribute it without the express permission of Wiley. The solution presentation is copyright myself, all rights are reserved. The opinions within this presentation are those of mine and not the authors of the textbook of Wiley. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to be doing here today exercise 5-5, which is part of the balance sheet. And let's get to this right over here. So Ahura, hmm, Star Trek company has decided to expand its operations. The bookkeeper recently completed uh, the following balance sheet in order to obtain additional funds for expansion. So Ahura Company balance sheet for the year ended 2020. And we have all these different items over here. And what the questions is asking us to do is to prepare a revised balance sheet given the available information. Assume that the accumulated depreciation balance for the buildings is 160 and the equipment uh, for the equipment is 105. The allowance for doubtful accounts is a balance of 17. The pension obligation is considered to be a long-term liability. Okay, so the first things in terms of like looking at this balance sheet, like what's missing, a uh, few different things here. Is the balance sheet for the year ended or is it as of December 31st, 2020? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. If I said for the year ended, <laughs> This would be, I would have to show cash as of every moment, right? But our balance sheet has to be as a snapshot in time. What else is this balance sheet missing? Well, let's go through and take a look. So if I go over here to sec.gov, my favorite company, as far as looking at the financial statements go, is Apple, and I'll show you why. The reason why I like Apple is because they, first off, they make amazing products. This is being made on a 2017 MacBook Pro. Uh, and right over here, you get Apple. You can always send me new products for me to test. I would love it. So right over here is where we're looking at the consolidated balance sheets. This is as of a date, right? A lot of times I like to say as of, but you can just show a date um, over here. Well, the first thing you notice is that we have total current assets, total non-current assets, total assets, right? And over here, we don't see any of that. We don't see any kind of like that separation. I, the other kind of thing though, is that when it comes to this, I just wanna kind of show you a couple different things. When I go to say Tesla, and the reason why I wanna show you Tesla briefly is when we look at Tesla's 10K, or their balance sheet. I want you to notice something here. And this is, if I go over here to Tesla, what you'll notice here is that for their assets, they're showing total current assets, but then they just list everything else below. And you're gonna find a lot of companies that go through and do this. They'll basically say, here's current, because that's what we're, we are required to disclose. And then over here is everything else. So it's really both of these financial statements have been used by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So they obviously will accept both, but obviously the minimum requirement, and we know why this is so important, is showing current assets and current liabilities. Why is that so important? Our creditors need to know if we're going to be able to pay them back or those users of the external financial statements. So let's go ahead over here and we'll start with the Hura company. Uh, balance sheet as of 12 31 20. 
And we'll just kind of go over here and say our assets, uh, basically. Okay, so what are the assets? So right over here, we've got cash of 230,000. Okay. Over here, so all I'm being asked to do is prepare a revised balance sheet given the available information. It also tells me over here that the allowance for doubtful accounts is a balance of 17,000. So if I wanted to, I could show accounts receivable less the allowance for doubtful accounts is gonna give me accounts receivable net. Now I know that accounts receivable net is 340,000, right? If the allowance for doubtful accounts is 17,000, right? What is the allowance for doubtful accounts? It is the contra asset account to receivables. It is the amount that we do not expect to collect. If you go through my videos, you'll find plenty that I go through and talk about the allowance for doubtful accounts. So that means that AR prior to the allowance for doubtful accounts balance was going to be $357,000. Okay. Inventory lower of cost or market, that's what we want to go through and see. So right over here, uh, 401,000, okay. Now here comes our first problem, okay? Equity investments marketable at cost, fair value is 120, okay? So when it comes to equity investments, right? What I have to go through is I have to show it at the lower of cost or market and, or the, I should really say the lower cost or fair value. Why is that? It's because right now my balance sheet is being overstated. Okay. So we're going to show here equity investments, and this is going to be over here at $120,000. Now, if I were to go through and to do this, like how do I adjust an equity investment? Well, the equity investment is essentially going to be over here. If I show over here, equity investments, and I have 140,000. And if in fact, basically the ending balance of this equity investment is actually 120,000, I'm gonna to need to make an adjustment. And the adjustment that I'm gonna be going through and making is gonna to be to an unrealized holding gain or loss on the securities. So over here, I have to debit this, or I should say unrealized holding gains. I have to credit equity investments to get from my cost down to here. And so I'm gonna go through over here and I'm gonna debit the unrealized holding gain or loss. Now, if I look over here, like what's going on with these unrealized holding gains, when you see marketable securities over here on the financial statements for Apple, you'll see this right over here. Now, what's gonna happen is, is you have a few different things that can kind of like pop up and you'll see this, uh, let's go down here and take a look at our income statement. So. In our income statement, basically what you have down here is you have the, oh, where did this go? Let's go right over here. Okay. So what you have over here in the income statement for a corporation, okay, is that if I actually went through and sold securities at a gain or loss, meaning an actual sale, it's probably going to show up other here as other income expense. Right. But what you're going to notice down here is that if I kind of creep below, and oh, it's kind of creepy, Halloween season, other dad jokes, we requested that, uh, other comprehensive income or loss. What you're going to notice here is you're going to see these unrealized changes in derivatives or other securities. So, what we're going to do with these types of holding gains or losses is they're gonna basically be a part of other comprehensive income, right? So when we look at the balance sheet over here for Apple, uh, we're going to basically put these into other, uh, other accumulated, other comprehensive income or loss. 
So that's where that balance is going to be. Wow, I'm surprised I didn't actually go through and do this question. This is a great question, but I'm not going to put it on this class's test. That will be for uh, spring 22. Okay, so right over here, right? So I have over here my equity investments. We'll see what we need to do with that a little bit later. Okay, so let's just kind of go through over here. Now, with intangible assets like Goodwill, this is going to be non-current. The cash surrender value of life insurance, I'm also going to assume that that's going to be non-current asset. What is the cash surrender value of the life insurance? Well, let's go through and look it up. So what it is, is that if I'm buying a, God, is it a whole or a term life policy? I basically, I've kind of been using it as an, as an investment vehicle while at the same time getting life insurance. So over here, I've got the cash surrender value of life insurance. And so over here, uh, cash Investopedia, thank you. Um, again, right over here. So it's defined as the internal value of an insurance policy at a point, which is the accumulated account minus the surrender charge. So over here, um, what you're going to basically go through and do is you'll essentially show it as a I would show it as a non-current asset. Okay, so, all right, so look, let's over here. So buildings, property, equipment, land held for future use, those are all gonna be non-current assets, goodwill, non-current. Cash surrender value of life insurance, I would list it as non-current unless we have an intention of using it this year, which I'm just gonna assume we don't. And now we're gonna have prepaid expenses. Now, with the equity investments, I'm also making the assumption that we're planning on using it within the next year. Remember, when we're looking at assets, right, we've got two categories. We have current assets, and then we're going to have non-current assets. So over here, my prepaid expenses are going to be 12000 So my total current assets are going to be the sum of all of these balances right over here. Okay, or basically my cash plus the accounts receivable net plus the inventory plus the equity investments plus the prepaid expenses. Okay, for my non-current assets. Okay, now, again, what you'll oftentimes see companies do is they'll show property, plant, and equipment net. You will also see other companies show instead of showing property plants and equipment net what they will do is they will i think it may be macy's that will show it on the front of it let's see okay, hold on So if I look at the balance sheet of Macy's and I go to their quarterly report and on the face of the financial statement, what you're going to see over here, ah, okay. So property and equipment net of accumulated depreciation and amortization. Okay. So they actually go through and list the balances on the face of the financial statements. Again, over here, if we see property, plant and equipment net, and this is for Tesla, Right, Tesla, you go back to the footnotes and take a look at it, right? So there's going to be a different, you know, reasons why you would go through and present it that way. So, you know, as long as you're going through and showing it in the footnotes, that's all that really matters, right? For a company like Macy's, they may be going through and doing it because their real estate is really the value of the company. It's not in the red star, which will probably be repurchased by the, uh, by, the by Russia. Okay. So when they go bankrupt, all right, I'm not saying that they will, they'll just defend all retailers. Okay, except for Amazon. Okay, so right over here, we've got non-current assets. So what we'll do here is we'll show buildings less accumulated depreciation is gonna give us buildings net, okay? Okay, so right over here, that building is net. My spelling is probably totally off today. 
right over here. So my building's net value is 570,000, right? So if it's 570,000 right over here, it says that the accumulated depreciation balance for buildings is 160,000. So what that means is we got 160,000 here. So my gross amount of the buildings is going to be 730,000. So I take 730 minus the 160 accumulated depreciation is gonna give me buildings net. Note over here, accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. It reduces the carrying value of buildings. Have videos on that, more than welcome to go through and check those out. Okay, we've got equipment. So for my equipment, and we can just specify this here. So my equipment net is going to be $160,000. So over here, my equipment balance or my, my accumulated depreciation is 105. So that basically means that on a gross basis, I had $265,000 of equipment. Okay, again, it's the equipment minus the accumulated depreciation gives us over here equipment net. I was given these two values. So that basically means if I'm solving for X, it's X minus 105 equals 160. What is X equal to? X is equal to 265. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these other non-current assets. The other thing we also wanna kind of keep in mind is when we're listing out our assets, current or non-current, we want to do that in the order of liquidity. What you'll notice up here is with most financial statements they are showing cash and cash equivalents, marketable securities. Why is marketable securities more, basically more liquid than accounts receivable? I can sell my marketable securities tomorrow. For accounts receivable, I have to wait it to collect from the customers. Inventory is not going to be as liquid as accounts receivable. This because, again, I haven't sold this yet. I sold the inventory, and that's what generated the accounts receivable, or I performed the services, which generated the accounts receivable. Okay, so right over here, I've got equipment net. The next thing I'm going to have over here is land held for future use. Right, and generally by definition, all property, plant, and equipment is going to be non-current. Okay, now I'm gonna getting over here to the other ones. So I've got cash, surrender, value of life, insurance. This I would probably put up a little bit higher. Yeah, actually, let's go ahead and do that now to make this technically correct. Okay. And again, this would be depending upon the terms, the policy, and then goodwill. Okay, goodwill is, how does goodwill come about? It's when I, buy a, when I buy a company in excess of its fair market value. So right over here, this is my goodwill. Okay, so let's just go through over here. So my total non-current assets are going to be 90,000 plus 570, plus 160, plus 175, plus 80, or a million 75. So my total assets are going to be my non-current plus my current for a total of 2,178,000. All right, let's now go and check out our liabilities. Now, when it comes to doing a um, classified balance sheet, the only difference between, you know, like the one that we learn when we're first starting out and a classified balance sheet is that we are separating our current and non-current assets and liabilities. Owner's equity is pretty much going to stay the same. Okay, so right over here, so I've got total assets. So my liabilities, I'm gonna have current liabilities. So for my current liabilities, I'm gonna have accounts payable, notes payable that are due within a year. So my accounts payable are gonna be 135,000. My notes payable are gonna be 125. The key for basically being a current or non-current is if it's due within a year of the balance sheet date. Now, 
Here, the pension obligation is listed as a current liability, but this is telling us is that it's considered to be a long-term liability. And by the way, this is for Kiso or for Wiley, I wouldn't call it long-term, I would call it non-current. Non-current is the proper disclosure, and it's basically because I'm sure the, the, someone got sued, and so they said, well, long-term sounds like a long time away. No, it, you wanna say it's non-current. That's the way that almost every single, or you just don't list, you just list them out. You don't even separate it out like that, or just as long as it's below current liabilities. So we're gonna basically move that pension obligation below. So over here, we've got rent payable. So our rent payable is a current liability. Now, the premium on bonds payable, that is not a current liability. That is, we got more money than the face value of the bonds. And that is going to be amortized as we go through and pay interest expense. So that premium on bonds payable is gonna follow the bond payable under the non-current liabilities. So my total current liabilities is going to be 135 plus 125 plus 49 or 309,000. Okay. Now, the other thing I don't do as well is I'm not putting a little underlines under there. So, you know, I'm more concerned with you guys are learning the material with everyone learning the material as opposed to, you know, getting freaked out about formatting. You can do that when you start your job in public accounting. Okay, so over here for non-current liabilities, what do we have? So for non-current liabilities we have is we have a pension obligation. So our pension obligation is 82,000, okay? Over here, we have bonds payable, and we're gonna show that at 500,000. And then we're gonna have plus our premium on bonds payable at 53,000. What this is gonna give us, and this is what I call it. So I call this bond payable carrying value, okay? This is gonna be 500 plus 53 or 553. If I said bond payable net, that is gonna be something I use when there is a discount on bond payable. I don't know what the solution is going to show because honestly, I haven't looked at it yet, but that's how I would, this is how I would show it is the carrying value of the bond payable. I think that that's the more appropriate language to go through and to use. Okay, so we got our pension obligation. We have our accounts payable, notes payable. We've dealt with those. We've dealt with our pension obligation, which is going to be non-current. Uh, we got our rent payable right over here. We have premium on bonds payable and bonds payable. Okay. Now, the next thing I wanna show you really quickly too, is that if you ever see a company that uses a dollar par common stock uh, you, and, and they're publicly traded, uh, that's a lawsuit, okay? Look at what the par values are right over here of Apple. Oh, it's 0. 0.00001, okay? The only one that I know that has like, even look at Tesla, it's 0. 0.001 uh, for both common and preferred. Down over here for Macy's, it's not showing us anything. Mm, that's interesting. So right over here, right? So if we see this, why is it 0. 0.0001? It is because there is, if I sell shares for below par value, um, I could as a shareholder be liable to the corporation for the difference between par and the what I paid for it if I sold stock for below par. The only companies I have seen that have a very high par value are um, Warren Buffett's uh, company. Uh, and the reason is, and why is that name escaping me? Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> so Berkshire Hathaway. So Berkshire Hathaway, and I'll just show this to you. It's kind of fun. Okay, so let's just go here and let's say Berkshire Hathaway stock price. Oh, 418,000, <laughs> that's my cost per share, okay? So right over here, and they are BRK. So let's go ahead and take a look at Birkenstocks. Oh, excuse me, that's more dad humor. I love Birkenstocks, by the way. Um, I'm more than willing to promote that on my channel. Okay, so it's the most comfortable shoes on earth. Just check them out. Okay, I right over here. So if I go to BRK and I go to Berkshire Hathaway, 
and I'm going to look at their 10K. And when I look at their 10K and I take a look at their uh, owner's equity section, let's just check this out really quickly. And we're going to go to item eight. Okay. And they are audited by Deloitte. Well, Deloitte and Touche. Hmm. Why are they not calling themselves Deloitte? Okay. So right over here, when you look at this on their um, owner's equity, right? Oh, they're not even showing it here. Interesting. Okay. Let's see here. Um, let's take a look at their notes. Let's just take a look at like this. Par value. Oh, right over here. So their class A common stock has a $5 par value. And then over here, their class B common shares has a 0.33 par value. But these class A common shares sell for $418,000. So is there ever a risk of selling stock below par? No. But everybody else, you need to go through and basically set up your, you know, when you're going through and doing it, just make sure that you're doing it at a very low par value. Okay, that's enough. So this is going to give us over here to our total non-current liabilities, okay? And right over here, our total non-current liabilities are 635. So our total liabilities are going to be 309 plus 635 or 944,000. Okay, so the next part over here is going to be stockholders' equity. Okay, so over here, we've got common stock at par, additional paid in capital common stock. Okay, now this is interesting because what I would want to do is to show an other accumulated comp loss of 20,000. And this is when you're going through and looking at this, this is how I would go through and do it. But what I, my gut feeling is telling me is that for retained earnings, they're not going to do this, right? They're not going to show an un, basically an unrealized, you know, the, the loss. So if I'm looking at this right here and I have to go through and determine what my retained earnings is, is that what I'm going to go through in here and do is say, okay, if my total assets are 2,178, or my total assets, my liabilities are going to be 944. My common stock at par is 290. My additional paid in capital common stock is 160. That means my retained earnings would be 784. Now, the other way that I would show you that is going to be more technically correct is going to be other accumulated uh, comprehensive loss of 20,000. Okay. And if that in fact was the case, right, if my total, I've got a million 234, this is going to be 804. Because when I go through and I add this up, that has to be the same amount. So we'll, I'm going to take a look at the solution manual for this particular question. I haven't looked at it might have to actually redo the entire video. So like we're on the edge of our seats. So this is my total owner's equity. And so my total liabilities and owner's equity is going to be 944 plus 2,134, 2,178, which equals my total assets. So we're all on the edge of our seats as I go and look up the solution. So just give me a moment. Okay, so I looked at the solution and what Kiso went through and did is they basically used this part over here. I don't have permission to, uh, they basically use this. However, what they did was, is on the balance sheet is they went through and they were showing like property plant and equipment and breaking this out separately. I don't agree with the way that they have their solution done. Right. And the other thing that they didn't do is that when you've got an other accumulated comp comprehensive loss, they didn't pick that up. Now, this is chapter five, and we don't talk about the other accumulated comprehensive losses until chapter 17 in the Wiley textbook. 
So it doesn't surprise me, but this is generally the answer that you should be getting. But let me just be really clear. Like this is how I determine whether or not if I'm doing something correctly, right? I'm gonna go and look at uh, basically the financial statements of publicly traded companies. And when you see this over here for Berkshire, and this is even more bizarre because it's like you're listing out here, there's not even a separation between current and non-current, but they're Berkshire, so I guess they can do whatever they want. Uh, if I come over here to look at Tesla, well, let's just, let's just pick a different company. Let's go to Costco. So if I look at Costco and their financial statements, and if I just go, just go to their quarterly report and look at their balance sheet, again, you're gonna see over here that you know, you've know you got current, non-current, or they'll just list it out here as other assets. I probably think it's better, like they'll say other long-term. Again, you're just going to see it kind of all over the board in terms of what different companies go through and do. And even if we look at over here, let's go to, uh, what's another one? Uh, let's take a look at Chenier. So over here for Chenier Energy, they make natural gas facilities. By the way, you want to see a really cool legal entity structured, abbreviated. Oh, wow. Look at this one. If you come in and figure that one out and explain it to me, that's like pretty awesome. Okay. If I look over here though, at current assets and then, so everybody is kind of going through, except for Berkshire, is going through like enlisting out all their current assets. And then they're just basically dumping everything else down here below as non-current. So again, you'll see different things. I don't agree. I mean, like the way that the Kiso textbook is showing it to you, I don't necessarily agree with their solutions. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a way of doing it. And again, for I'm kind of following what I see on most publicly traded companies. I serve as a board member and a designated financial expert as a board member right now for a publicly traded company. By the way, these are my opinions, not theirs. So if I were looking at this from a CFO perspective, I would want to kind of show it like you've got to show current assets, you have to show current liabilities. But when it comes, though, to the other portions of the, of the balance sheet, um, it just it's one of those things where I would never show those groupings like that unless I'm showing the groupings as, you know, non-current. So. <laughs> that is my exercise, my walkthrough solution of exercise 5-5. So my last part here is I want to thank Wiley for allowing me to use their solutions. I think it's pretty cool that they're allowing me to do it. Uh, do not forget to like and subscribe. If you are taking intermediate accounting and you're using the Wiley 17th edition and you want me to create a solution for a question that you're having trouble with, just ask in the comments of any one of my videos. I do eventually read them. So if you have any questions about that, just feel free to ask. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on the next video. Have a great one.